Thousands are annually slaughtered in the quiet sick room. Governments should at once either banish medical men and prescribe condemn their blundering art, or they should adopt some better means to protect the lives of the people than at present prevail, when they look far less after the practice of this dangerous profession and the murders committed in it than after the lowest trades. Dr. Frank, eminent European author and practitioner, 1800s. Not only did the many positive changes from the latter 1800s into the mid-1900s result in a massive decline in mortality from smallpox, measles, whooping cough, scarlet fever, etc., but another major factor was also causing deaths for centuries, the medical treatments themselves. For upwards of 23 centuries to starve, bleed, purge, and torture had been the all but exclusive business of the man of medicine. From the days of Hippocrates till within the last few years, this was the undoubted practice in almost all diseases. In truth, what from the gloom of the sick room, and what from the obscurity that enveloped the science, no question was ever asked by the public at large about medical matters. The possession of a diploma or degree from a school or university of reputation was the only requisite for practice. The practice itself, no matter how destructive, signified little so long as it was the established practice. Samuel Dixon, M.D., Glasgow, 1855. Less than 35 years ago, 1850, millions of human beings up to that time had gone to untimely graves, begging piteously for a cup of water to cool their parched lips, while the burning fire of fever was consuming their lives. Doctors in those days said, cold water is death, do not give a drop. Give the patient a dose of calomel, mercury, and a spoonful of warm water. Not only were fever patients denied cold water, nature's remedy, but light and pure air were also denied them, and they were drugged with calomel, physicked with jalap, a strong purgative, depleted of their lifeblood by the lancet, and starved until they gave up the ghost, a tribute to this medical delusion. Alexander Milton Ross M.D., Toronto, 1888. The single, uncombined, different, and confessed poisons in daily use by the dominant school of medicine number 107. Among these are phosphorus, strychnine, mercury, opium, and arsenic. The various combinations of these five violent poisons number, respectively, 27 combinations of phosphorus, 5 of strychnia, 47 of mercury, 25 of opium, and 14 of arsenic. The poisons that are more or less often used number many hundreds. Dr. Brody, Chicago, author of Medical Practice Without Poisons, late 1800s. Mankind has been drugged to death, and the world would be better off if the contents of every apothecary shop were emptied into the sea, though the consequences to the fishes would be lamentable. The disgrace of medicine has been the colossal system of self-deception, in obedience to which minds have been emptied of their cankering minerals, the entrails of animals taxed for their impurities. The poison bags of reptiles drained of their venom and all the inconceivable abominations thus obtained thrust down the throats of human beings suffering from some fault of organization, nourishment or vital stimulation. Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, 1860s Keeping people deprived of water and fresh air, often drained of blood until fainting, Using toxic medicines like mercury and arsenic and other harmful notions killed vast numbers. However, those deaths were never recorded as medically caused. Instead, countless souls died, counted as having died of a disease the doctor was treating. More harm than good has been done by the use of drugs in the treatment of measles, scarlatina, and other self-limited diseases. In their zeal to do good, physicians have done much harm. They have hurried thousands to the grave who would have recovered if left to nature. Professor Alonzo Clark, MDU, New York College of Physicians and Surgeons, 1800s. The drugs administered for scarlet fever destroys far more than that disease does. Dr. B. F. Barker, New York Medical College, 1800s. The art of healing is like an unroofed building uncovered at the top and cracked at the foundation. I am incessantly led to make apology for the instability of the theories and practice of physic. Dissections daily convince us of our ignorance of disease, and cause us to blush at our prescription. 
What mischief have we not done under the belief of false facts and false theories? We have assisted in multiplying diseases. We have done more, we have increased their fatality. Benjamin Rush, M.D., University of Pennsylvania, signatory to the U.S. Declaration of Independence, 1700s. The science of medicine is barbarous jargon, and the effects of our medicines on the human system are in the highest degree uncertain, except that they have already destroyed more lives than war, pestilence and famine combined. Dr. John Mason Good, early 1800s. Physicians have slain more than war. As instruments of death in their hands, calomel, bleeding and other medicines, have done more than powder and ball. The public would be infinitely better off without professed physicians. Dr. Eliphalet Kimball, New Hampshire, author of Thoughts on Natural Principles, 1867. By the late 1800s, many recognized that fresh air, sunshine, clean water, not bleeding someone to the point of passing out, avoiding toxic medications, and stopping other wrong-headed medical notions were in the patient's best interests. Once many of these horrifying destructive practices fell out of use, so did many deaths from the diseases they intended to treat. Much like it has happened in previous centuries, medical errors are still rarely acknowledged. Today, a quarter of a million people die annually in the United States alone due to medical errors. Yet the CDC and other medical organizations simply ignore medical errors. For the better part of two decades, there's been a growing recognition that medical errors kill too many patients in the U.S. While exact numbers are elusive, a new analysis and estimate portrays an even grimmer picture. The new paper finds that as many as 250,000 people die each year from errors in hospitals and other health care facilities. That would make it the third leading cause of death in the U.S. ahead of respiratory disease, accidents, and even stroke. Dr. Martin McCary, a professor of surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine who led the research, joins me now. It turns out that we learned that the CDC does not consider medical error to be a cause of death in listing our national health statistics each year, even though the point estimate comes right in between number two and number three on the list, which means medical error is the number three cause of death in the United States. We're just not measuring it. These are studies of hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations in the top medical journals, and they are updating the 1999 Institute of Medicine report and there's broad consensus that the range is somewhere between 200 and 400,000. Our analysis came up with 251,000. No matter what number you pick, it's well above the currently listed number three cause of death. According to a 2013 article published in the Journal of Patient Safety, Dr. John T. James reports that patient adverse events, his uh, politically correct term for hospital medical mistakes, contribute to the death of approximately 440,000 patients in America each year. That's roughly one-sixth of the 2.5 million total deaths that occur in the United States each year. 37% of Americans die outside of hospitals. So, in fact, hospital medical errors contribute to the death of roughly one-fourth of all patients who die in U.S. hospitals. Part of the blame of over-medication rests, as I have said with the profession, in yielding to the tendency to self-delusion, which seems almost inseparable from the practice. In our mode of inference, too often adopted, of counting only our favorable cases and in falling into the not uncommon error known in scholastic phrase as post hoc ergo propter hoc. The patient got well after taking my medicines. Therefore, he got well because of taking them. The greater portion of this blame, however, rests properly with the public, which insists on its right to be poisoned by somebody like Barnum of illustrious memory, they believe in and practice on the measureless gullibility of a public which actually enjoys being humbug. The whole dishonest and shameless business is built, as on a rock, upon the popular delusion that sick people must feed upon noxious substances. The more the better, the nastier, the more effective.
the outside pressure upon the physician is very great, tending to force him to active treatment, whether in his judgment necessary or not. Some error of diet, some improper habit of the patient, may only need correction and the administration of drugs be unnecessary or hurtful. H. Brown, M.D., Huntsville, Kentucky, 1892. Thank you for watching. References and links are down below. If you thought this information was valuable, please like and share. If you agree or disagree with anything, please respectfully comment. We all learn when we share and consider other people's views. Please visit DissolvingIllusions.com for free charts, photos, book chapters, book audio, and more. Please visit MovingBackFromMidnight.com, which contains information on my new book on the major environmental issues we face as a planet, including free book chapters, photos, and more. In this time of increasing censorship and attacks on free speech, please watch my videos on Odyssey.com. Thank you, and have a stellar day!